Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry to audiences around the world. Each week we endeavor to bring you an interview with someone who has much to share from their own spiritual life and work, and who has been deeply influenced by the writings of Henry Nouwen. We invite you to share the daily meditations and these podcasts with your friends and family. Through them, we can continue to introduce new audiences to the writings and teachings of Henry Nouwen and remind each listener that they are a beloved child of God. Now let me take a moment to introduce today's guest. Marjorie J. Thompson is an ordained Presbyterian minister. She has over 30 years experience in retreat work, teaching, and writing on spiritual formation. Author of the best-selling book, Soul Feast, An Invitation to the Christian Spiritual Life, Marjorie considers writing central to her calling. A few years ago, we were so fortunate that Marjorie accepted our invitation to write the first book in our Henry Nouwen Caregiving series. Drawing from her decades of experience as a caregiver, first for aging parents and, and then for her own husband, Marjorie wrote Courage for Caregivers, Sustenance for the Journey in Company with Henry J.M. Nowen. We're thrilled that InterVarsity Press loved the book and has asked if they can release it. Marjorie, it's one of the most valuable contributions I think you've made to extending Henry's legacy. You found treasures there and you have planted them in Courage for Caregivers. Tell me a little bit about the caregiving journey that you have been on yourself and how this infuses your book. Yes, thank you, Karen. Uh, th- thank you for inviting me to, to speak with you about this today. It, you know, I think in many ways, writing the book on caregiving, Courage for Caregivers, was a wonderful opportunity for me to process at a deeper level my own experience of caregiving. I had come through, <laughs> um, goodness, um, almost two years of giving care to my own mother in our home uh, the last 20 months of her life she was with us and then uh, actually at the same time we took in John's mother my mother-in-law whose nickname was Bab so I'll just refer to her as Bab Um, she actually lived with us the last 11 years of her life she was just about 100 years old when when she died and then the the sequence was that uh, my my own husband John, uh, who had helped me with this caregiving over all these years, uh, ended up. It, it turned out that he actually had a rare form of cancer even before his mother died, but we had no idea. And he began to get ill, uh, to show symptoms of illness only. Um, three months after her death, and then we were into um, a period of several months until he died just nine and a half months after she did. So uh, it it was a very intense experience of caregiving with, with multiple very close family members for me. We, we were all living together in one household, and uh, at the end of that about, you know, 12 year period of time, uh, a household of four had become a household of one. And mm-hmm. it, it, it all kind of happened so surprisingly, I think, and, and to me, shockingly, at the end, I, I was in no way prepared for John's illness or death so soon after his mother. Um, and uh, that that was it, it, that was toward the end of 2014 that John died, and I think it was it was just maybe two years later when you and I had the first conversation about doing a book on caregiving. And I have to say that in some ways I had just finally, you know, really processed what I would say adequately processed my grief over John's death, and. Uh, in order to move forward with my life. And so writing this book, which came out in 2017, I was, you know, I had started work on it in 2016. 
um, was really an amazing opportunity for me, um, first of all, to just steep myself in some of Henry's wisdom about caring and caregiving. Um, he was just so masterful at expressing deep truths about um, care and that were very helpful to me. And, and then connecting that with my own journey uh, through caregiving and sort of pulling it together with other stories um, in, in a form that I hoped would really um, be accessible to many, many caregivers. So um, that's sort of the, the way I look back on this. It was an amazing gift to me, the opportunity to write the book. Um, I, I can tell you really probably more ab about um, my caregiving experience with my mother and, and with Bab, my mother-in-law. Um, with John, my, care, my actual caregiving was relatively short because he didn't become ill enough to really need that from me until the last um, two months of his life. And the last month of his life, he was hospitalized most of that time in ICU. So his care was largely out of my hands. Uh, so that was a, a much shorter and much more intense kind of experience. But let me, let me just say a few words um, to orient anyone uh, who may be listening to the situations in our home with our two mothers. So my mother came with advanced um, heart issues and lung issues. She had COPD um, and was, you know, it was a chronic lung condition uh, which just got progressively worse. And she was really in the last phases of that. So her needs, her physical needs were enormous. She was tethered to oxygen tubes anytime, you know, in bed and out. Um, and so it was, it was physically demanding in many ways. With Bab, um, she was actually in pretty good shape when she first came to live with us at age 89. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, she was, she, she was still you know, taking vigorous walks outside with her cane and um, caring, um, largely caring for our two cats. She just loved them and they could <laughs> stay in her apartment. <laughs> uh, we couldn't keep them in the main house because I would get allergic responses. So, um, you know, she and she loved to cook. So, every you know, she would cook meals for the whole family um, once or twice a week, which was great. It really helped John and me. We were both still working full time. So she was in good shape um, to begin with, but um, mother died 20 months after coming to us, and within two months, two months of mother's death, Bab fell and broke her hip. Wow! And so, and so suddenly, you know, just just at the time when, you know. I thought, I think both John and I felt like, you know, right at the end of the tunnel, we're, we're going to have a little more breathing space and a little more time to ourselves. And, you know, uh, all of a sudden we were just thrust right back into very intense caregiving in our home with, you know, a 90 year old woman with a broken hip. And um, she made a very good recovery from that in many ways. But her balance was poor, and so she was prone to falls. And, you know, she kind of, uh, she did well enough to get back to her cane for a while. And then, you know, she kind of went from the cane to the walker, and then eventually from the walker to a wheelchair. And so, you know, the last several years of her life, she was um, mostly in, in a wheelchair. Th those were the, the situations. We did have... Uh, daytime caregivers come in that we paid for services in the day because, again, we were both working full-time. And um, let's see, for the first seven years, um, John and I were commuting in and out of town together. So that was like a 45-minute commute each way. But after that, 
from from 2009 until Bab died in 2013, I was actually working out of a home office, which helped quite a bit. And what that meant was I took on more of the caregiving responsibilities. And with time, uh, Bab really wanted me to take on more and more of it for her intimate care. She felt more comfortable with me doing that. So, um, as you can imagine, it became to the end all consuming. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. And, and, and it's probably the case for so many caregivers. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, particularly when you're mm-hmm. caring for people who are aging, because it's not, you're not going to get better. You're just going to get older. That's really a sad reality in all of this. But it, it, it means yeah. that in a way, that, it, that little glimpse that you had that maybe you and John would get some time it got consumed very quickly. Um, yes. I think it's so valuable for people as they're listening to know this is someone who's been in the trenches, who understands all the responsibilities that come with caregiving, the inescapable responsibilities that come with it. And I think the book co- goes there in a very special way, not just in your life, but in the stories you chose to wo- weave into it, you know, stories of parents dealing with fra- fragile children or just difficult, difficult situations that are really the, the, the hub of what it is to be a caregiver. Yes, and, you know, there, there are so many people today, more and more, uh, as we have a, an aging population. And, of course, medical, uh, you know, better medical care means people are living longer. Um, but this often means that you know, people in their 60s and 70s are caring for aging parents in their 80s and 90s yeah. um, or even beyond. And their own energy levels are, you know, definitely not what they once were. And then in many cases, you have uh, perhaps parents of kids, um, in uh, parents in their 40s and 50s who are still caring for children. Uh, <clears throat> some of them may, in fact, have special needs. And then also their their parents trying to figure out how to balance all of that. Um, it is, you know, we're, we're really living in a time when these challenges are getting more and more uh, demanding and, and draining for people. I think there's so many different kinds of, of caregiving and different sorts of needs. Um, I did become aware, John and I became aware after a couple of years of Bab living with us, that she actually had some cognitive limitations and some behavioral patterns that were, um, you know, I, I'm sure if she had been a, a kid any time in the last 20 years or more, uh, she would have been diagnosed with ADD. Um, and probably somewhere on the mild side of the autism spectrum. That that was our guess, that she had suffered from those things probably all her life, but never diagnosed, because in her day, those, those diagnoses weren't around. <laughs> but she showed um, a number of, of kind of cognitive limitations that we also had to sort of cope with as we dealt with her. And Obviously, you know, as a person is aging and the brain is is beginning to change um, just physiologically, any cognitive issues that are there are going to deteriorate. So um, we got a little taste of that. Uh, Not as much as many people, though. We were fortunate. I know that, um, you know, her memory... Uh, kind of my my image of her memory was sort of Swiss cheese you know, <laughs> in the last few, few uh. years of her life. And lots of things sort of slipped through, and um, she wouldn't remember that um, what she had said or a story she had told um, just you know the day before. Mm-hmm. But we didn't really experience some of the very painful things that happen when. Um, they're caregiving for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia where per- real um, profound personality changes come mm-hmm. into play. And, mm-hmm. um, we were very lucky in that. There was a little bit of paranoia toward the end, but not a lot. And 
I think for many people, that's just one of the most difficult things to cope with when when someone you've known and loved all your life, their personality changes, and it's just so hard to know how how to relate to them. Um, so it's not just a matter of the physical care, but shifts in in the emotional relationship and your sense of identity in relation to that person and that person's identity may seem to just be crumbling. So there, there's so many pieces to this. And then in this book, actually, and I might just mention, um, since I'm assuming most people listening will not have, uh, will not know about this book or have read it, but I interviewed eight people uh, to get some different kinds of stories from my own caregiving stories. And uh, four of them are particularly featured in one of the uh, appendices at the end. Um, but they're, the stories of all, all of them are sort of scattered through the book. And a couple of them are just exactly these situations you have named with medically fragile children whose situations um, are irreversible. They, they will not change. Parents know that they will be caring for these children as as long as they either they or the child live, and it is so exhausting. It, it's exhausting physically and emotionally. Um, I, I have to say that just you know the interviews that I conducted for this gave me such profound um, empathy for and amazed gratitude. <laughs> Um, for the resilience and the remarkable human spirit that, you know, by the grace of God, parents figure out how to do this and keep going. Um, I don't think I could have done the kind of caregiving that some of these parents have done with um, high-needs children. So there are some very moving <laughs> stories uh, in the book and I hope you know my hope is that the book offers some perspectives and uh, practices and and literally encouragement courage uh, to keep going that's why the book is titled the way it is <laughs> courage for caregivers you know I I think um, we need that so much when we are in the trenches as you put it it's interesting because um, I, I think one of the very special aspects of the book is really that desire that people feel seen. Somebody gets what I'm going through. Somebody gets it. And there is a kind of refreshment in it as well. I love uh, Philip Yancey describes Henry Nouwen as the patron saint of caregiving or of caregivers. I thought that was very sweet. What exactly would you say Henry had to offer in it that, that in a way is sustenance for the journey? What did you find there? Yeah. Oh, you know, Henry just has so, so much to say on care. I, I think Yancey is absolutely on target. But, uh, Henry was the patron saint of caregivers. I, um, yeah, I probably uh, drew from 15 of Henry's 40 books yeah. um, and, and more more could have been used. He just, he brought care into everything he did, you know, from all the volumes of letters he wrote, uh, such attentiveness to just hundreds and hundreds of people in his letters. I, I think of his, his pastoral care at the large daybreak community with the whole community, all, all of them, the core members and the volunteers, everybody there. Um, his own caregiving physically for Adam at, at daybreak. Uh, he, he was just steeped in a profound understanding of the nature of care. And I guess, you know, let, let me try to identify just some, a few aspects of what I would call Henry's unique wisdom for caregiving. And the first of those is the idea that care is not to be confused with cure. Um, 
he talks about this really early on. He, he had this understanding very early on that we can always, always care, even if we cannot cure. And he could see so clearly that sometimes the medical establishment is so geared to cure that it doesn't do so well at the caring side. And so people can sometimes feel really uh, depersonalized or devalued when they're sort of caught up in the medical system and they're going from one specialist to another and one test to another. And um, it can feel very clinical and sometimes sort of antiseptic. And um, I think doctors, probably more more physicians than nurses on the whole, um, tend to learn to create a kind of um, professional distance from from the patient. But that doesn't always um, result in the, the best quality of care. And so Henry really makes this lovely distinction that I think is so important. Um, really caring for another person so that they feel seen and heard and loved, mm. <laughs> cared for, that is always healing. That's always healing emotionally and spiritually, even if it's not healing physically. And so, you know, Henry was always attuned to the spiritual side of things. And uh, <clears throat> so that's just a really important distinction that, that is brought into the book early on. I think another one that um, I really try to sort of keep uh, unfolding for people in different ways is Henry's strong understanding that mutuality really lies at the heart of all care relationships. They're always mutual. It's never a one-way street. And this is really, um, this is kind of eye-opening <laughs> for a yeah. lot of us. Mm-hmm. Um because, you know, if we're caring for a person who seems really profoundly incapacitated physically or, or mentally or whatever way it may be, um, it, it, it can be really hard to sense where that mutuality is. It's not going to come to us uh, all the time in an ordinary way that we can easily perceive Yeah, the way it might in a lot of other relationships. Yeah. But Henry was so clear that um, that all there's always an expression of mutuality. And I think it was his experience of caring for Adam at large daybreak that really taught him this. I mean, Adam could not speak or move on his mm-hmm. own. Mm-hmm. But what Henry learned was that nonetheless, <laughs> Adam exuded a kind of spiritual presence that was, actually healing for Henry and for many others who knew Adam. It wasn't just Henry. Others felt this in Adam's presence. And, you know, if, if, if that can happen, if people in the presence of someone as incapacitated as Adam can experience a, a mutuality in the relationship, then it can happen with anybody. And I think, um, we need to learn how to trust that the person we care for has gifts to offer us and just keep our eyes open for those gifts. The, those gifts that, that the care receiver has for us as caregivers may be the very reason God has called us into the circumstances of care that we find ourselves in. Um, well put. It, it may be the, the task of caregiving is for the sake of our learning and growth in God's eyes. And and I think that was true in my relationship with Bab. So that's, I'm speaking here from some learning of my own. And one final thing I would name as one of Henry's sort of unique wisdom um, perspectives, that our death can be as much a gift as our life. Um, this was something that, emerged for him later, uh, later in his own years. 
I think that he began to see that our death can be fruitful. He was asking the question, how do we make our death fruitful? I, I think this really started for him after his experience of being struck by the van, and uh, it, it was a near-death experience for him. Um, and he really did a lot of thinking about death and dying and what what lies beyond, because he had a glimpse of that. And and his questions about how we make our death fruitful, I think, really grew out of um, that experience and the fact that he was still in this world. So, you know, as as we face into our dying, and all of us will die at mm-hmm. some point, um, it's important for us to accept that and kind of look at it. You know, the old um, spiritual counsel uh, to keep your death always before your eyes is, is not a morbid counsel. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's realistic. We, we never yeah. know when our time will come. Um, but as we face into our dying, and generally this happens more when we get, you know, maybe terminally ill or we're toward the end yeah. of our life, um, age-wise, um, we can become so much more conscious of of what we want to leave behind in values, in love, in our what will our legacy be? You know, what what do what legacy do we choose to leave? And that's just I think a really, really helpful and fruitful question for us to think about. And there are um, some pe- elements of that in this book too, I think. But those were the three things that I thought of just you know, the, the care, not cure, the mutuality of relationships, and um, that our death can be fruitful. Um, those were very distinctive, sort of unique aspects of Henry's wisdom, I think. I know you created a workbook to accompany Courage for Caregivers. Can you tell me a little bit about the purpose of the workbook? Yeah, um, you know, when the book was first written, we were involved in a partnership with Church Health in Memphis, wonderful, wonderful ministry organization that had under its umbrella the whole parish nursing um, uh, association. And the the audience for the book, um, as far as Church Health was concerned, as they partnered with us, were these parish nurses because they did all kinds of programming in their churches and in other nonprofit settings. And so I developed a retreat, a one-day retreat for caregivers that was based on the content of the book. That retreat is Appendix A of the book. Mm -hmm. But I developed the workbook as the retreat participant workbook for that retreat. So the workbook is tied in with the one-day retreat, and it gives people a chance to really... um, delve into some of the um, content of the book, the themes, some wonderful quotes of Henry's to reflect on, and then to connect it with their own experience as a caregiver and to do some journaling on that and, you know, conversations with other people, other caregivers at the retreat around common experiences or different experiences Um, so that we learn from one another. So that's what the workbook was for. It was really designed in relation to the retreat. I think that um, InterVarsity is planning to uh, put that workbook in a downloadable PDF so that uh, anybody who purchases the book and wants to lead a retreat with the model in Appendix A can download the the workbook for participants. I think that's fantastic. We should also mention that there is a second book in the series that's coming out. And in fact, uh, I'm going to do a podcast with Susan Martins Miller, who wrote the 42 page or 42 day devotional for caregivers. It's called Hope for Caregivers in company with Henry J.M. Nowen. And uh, Susan has also much to share in, in, in this book. It is a daily devotional with a passage from Henry, a scripture, and then a reflection that she brings to it. But she, like you, comes from a life of having been a caregiver. And I would encourage people to listen to that and 
both books are coming out with InterVarsity and we think they're quite wonderful. Now, having talked about this, I, I feel like I need to go back a little bit. I think a lot of the people that are listening today may know you in another way. Perhaps they've been part of this free five-part series that we have launched this summer uh, called From Fear to Love, Spiritual Grounding in Anxious Times. Marta, you have been leading this, and it is it is a treasured experience. Uh, I say to people listening, it's free. It's on YouTube. You can get the links to it on our website. But I would like to hear just a little bit from you about uh, what your hopes were for this. I mean, it, the title is so perfect for the times we live in, you know, spiritual mm-hmm. grounding in anxious times. Tell me just a little bit about what your hopes were for this particular series. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd be delighted to say a little bit about this because it's just gotten started. The, the first of the five, I guess, uh, was what came online this past Saturday. So um, I, you know, I I think I, I want to use a word that's probably been way overused in the last six or seven years, but I can't think of a more accurate word and that is unprecedented uh, i think we are living in unprecedented times at several levels right now so w- let's just say with respect to recorded human history our climate crisis and ecological collapse is unprecedented um in a much, much shorter time frame with respect to the history of American democracy, uh, serious flirting with autocratic rule by an entire political party is unprecedented. Um, globally, the rapid rise of electronic information and disinformation, the reshaping of whole societies by social media, that's unprecedented. I, I mean, we're just in different times, and we're living through some very profound challenges, nationally and internationally. Um, I think I think people are frightened, anxious, disheartened, and it's so easy to lose hope. It's so easy to become despairing and and even desperate in times like these. Um, And I've succumbed to these feelings at times myself. I'm I'm not immune to losing heart. So my purpose in these meditations is to share some perspectives of faith that have really helped lift me from cynicism and despair um, and that I really hope and trust will be helpful to others who are struggling. Um, And in in each of these meditations, I also share a few simple spiritual practices that I think can help us stay grounded in our faith when when times are just very rough and we feel overwhelmed. Um, I mean, we've just been through two years of a global pandemic, um, something that hasn't happened probably since, you know, a hundred years ago, and most of us weren't alive when that happened either. So um, just so much going on, and it all layers, uh, on, on one layer on top of another. I guess um, I really hope that listeners to these webcasts will will find their minds opened to a more spacious realm where God's love and grace become deeply real to them and where hope can be found and and trust can be fed and nourished. Um, I would love to imagine that people might come away from engaging these meditations with just a bit more peace and joy in their hearts and a more hopeful outlook uh, that they can carry. I, I think every one of us 
is called to carry light in the darkness. Every one of us is called to to be to live in hope and to be a source of hope for others um, in a time when it's very easy to lose hope. And the only way we really can do that is to stay grounded spiritually ourselves. So that's what this is all about, spiritual grounding in anxious times. How, how do we move from fear to love? And so each, you know, each of the five is a different way of doing that and uh, sort of a, a different, we explore different themes. Well, we are so excited uh, as the Henry Nowen Society to be able to offer this. We made that decision because we found last year when we did our conference and we got the feedback from people that, Marjorie, your voice had spoken so deeply through the meditations, through what you shared, that people really responded to that. So in essence, I said, Marjorie, what could you give? And and you have given something that is of such worth and is so timely. It's been interesting for us to see. First of all, I want you to know as you, as a listener, these are free and they're available. And uh, they will be uh, on our YouTube site. You can access them through our website. Um, and the wonderful thing is, initially at the beginning, 7,000 people have signed up from 81 different countries. That's kind of floored us. We're kind of thrilled with that response. We know that people are hungry for uh, moving, for that movement from fear to love. And I, and I truly believe uh, you, Marjorie, are one of the gifted people who is able to identify the times we're living in, speak with kindness and gentleness and encouragement into it, and bring a voice of faith into it, bring, ground us. I'm very, very grateful. I I thank you for being with us today, Marjorie. Thanks so much. Thanks for writing the book, The Courage for Caregivers. Thanks for writing the the wonderful workbook. But also thank you so much for the series that you are doing right now. And I do encourage our listeners, don't miss it. It's really worthwhile. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate your words and it really just um, has been and remains for me such a deep honor um, to work with the Henry Nowen Society to help lift up Henry's wisdom um, to bring whatever wisdom I can offer um, to our situation now and I'm grateful for that opportunity so thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. Your book, Courage for Caregivers, Sustenance for the Journey in the Company of Henry J. M. Nowen, is a valuable resource, full of wisdom for caregivers and understanding for both the challenges and the joys they face on a daily basis. We're delighted InterVarsity Press has released this book and is giving it such a broad audience, a much broader audience than we could do. If you enjoyed today's podcast, we would be so grateful if you'd take time to give it a stellar review or a thumbs up or or even share it with your friends and family. As well, you'll find links in the show notes on our website to any content and resources or books discussed in this episode. There is even a link to books to get you started in case you're new to the writings of Henry Nowen. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe. Give us a thumbs up or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.